Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. It may be a little bit difficult because we're kind of like lopsided in attendance here. Uh, something, there must be a lot of money over on this side or something. I'm, I'm going to tape 20-pound notes underneath these seats over here to try to get some of you to move over to this side. But for right now, I'll work with you. Praise God. And so uh, we're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to preach to you today about the river of life. Out of the book of Revelation, one of my favorite passages, Revelation chapter 22. Praise God. I don't know if this is like a bad thing to say, but it's true. I've been going through a lot of trials the last couple of weeks. Do you ever go through trials? Praise God. You know, I don't backslide when I go through my trials. I stay saved. I stay serving God, but it's not always easy. It, and not always easy. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's hard to stay saved. I'm saying it's not always easy to endure and to get through, but we must. And sometimes when I read these passages that describe heaven and the afterlife and the things that are up ahead for us, they bring encouragement to my life. But as I was reading it, it also gave me things that I feel like we need to deal with. And I was looking over some other old notes that I kind of felt like I put this together and we're going to see how this goes. We are in the year where we've designated our theme for the year, God's Unlimited Power. Do you guys remember that? We did that at the beginning of the year. We said God's Unlimited Power. And so if we're going to have God's Unlimited Power, we're going to have to learn some things because too many of God's people have not learned how to operate in that power. They look at the power and say, boy, that would be a great thing to have. It's another thing, though, to say, Teach me, God, how to operate and to live in that power. Praise God. And so we want to help you with that today. Even if you're 10 years old and you're listening to us today, we want you to know that that's for you. Maybe you're a grandparent or a great-grandparent here today. It's for you as well. If you're single, it's for you. If you're engaged, well, you're not even paying attention to me if you're engaged. But if you're married, God's got help and hope for you. There's good, good things that are coming up. Praise God. The river of life. Let's read Revelation 22nd chapter. I'm going to use the New King James Version here today. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him i i, I just want to make a quick side point here that some of you are going to really be shocked when you make it to heaven because you haven't done much serving down here on earth. And when you get to be with him, you're going to be there serving God. You're going to say, what, me? Yeah, you. Get in the kitchen and make the lamb some food. (laughs) It won't be like that exactly, but I'm telling you, we serve here on earth and in heaven. Are you serving God or are you just living for Christ? Oh, man, that's a whole sermon right there because there's a difference. There's a difference. Let's go. Verse 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Their foreheads, you can have the name God right here. (laughs) Wow, that's bold, isn't it? Put something on your forehead, that's bold. That's making a statement whenever you do that. I think I might have shared this with you before, that Los Angeles street gang, sometimes they want to be bold about their neighborhood and the name of their gang, and they'll tattoo it right here on their forehead. So when they go to jail, everybody knows where they're from, and they're saying, like, I'm ready to get down for this right here. 
I wonder how many of us were willing to get down for Jesus at all costs. Let's keep reading. There shall be no night there. Hmm. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Verse 6 says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. They're not an opinion. They're not for certain people. They're faithful and they're true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord God, that you would speak to your people. We pray that the joy of the Lord would be in your house today, that it would be our strength. But we pray, Lord God, that we would be sober-minded in terms of your word and receiving that which you are speaking to us today. As your mouthpiece, I pray that I would decrease in Jesus, that you would increase. I pray that you would receive all the glory and all the honor, but yet I yield myself to you, Lord God. Uh, use every bit of who I am to glorify and magnify and to communicate to others uh, all that you are. And Lord, we thank you for those that have come today that are visiting. We pray that you would bless them, help them, and strengthen them, Lord God. Meet every need, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The picture that is being described here is one where we see in the center of all the activity is the throne of God. And that is kind of... uh, illustrating to you and to me how our lives should be. We should be putting God at the center of our lives. Now, that's not earth-shaking news to most of you, but if you started to do it, that would be pretty earth-shaking to most of you because many of you uh, love God. You come to church. You, you understand about church. Uh, it's, it's part of your life. You want to live morally somewhat like church, but having Jesus at the center of your life is a whole another ball of wax, as we say. It's a whole other issue. And so our lives need to grow and to bear fruit. Did you know that? See, too many of us, and I'll probably say this a couple of times, too many of us seek his blessing and ignore his fruit. We want him to help us, but we don't want to do anything to glorify him. Do you got that? It's okay to pray for blessing. It's okay to be blessed. It's okay to have things. It's okay to say, Lord, come down and give me your presence and your power, but don't let that happen without this decision to bear fruit. So let's look at first this river of life. As a matter of fact, it's called the river of the water of life. The water of life. Pastor Jonathan preached about water not too long ago in one of our Wednesday services and talked about the rivers of living water that flow out of Jesus. Just like in heaven, they flow from the throne. Uh, They can also flow into our lives. We need this river of living water, this water that brings life. Understand with me, That without this water that comes from him, because if you read it again, this it flows directly from the throne out into the people to the healing of the nations eventually. This comes from there, and without that, we can never see any of that. We can't see fruitfulness. But yet so many people after the initial uh, feeling of salvation kind of wears off and the experience kind of moves on. They, They stop seeking God and they try to live a Christian life, as crazy as it sounds, without Christ. They live a godly life without God. They're just trying to live morally upright. But we need his water because it's special. It's special water. Can you say amen? The quality of the water is significant. The Bible says it's pure. It's pure. Anything that comes from God is pure. And it's important for us, if we're going to see maximum fruitfulness in our lives, that we don't allow impurity to become the, the nature of who we are. That we allow purity to reign in our hearts. This means that we're pure in our minds. We don't allow our minds to get caught up in things that the Bible deems 
filthy, that the Bible deems unclean. This is why we, li- we have to really guard our hearts in this corrupt generation. It's a generation that is impure when it comes to integrity. That corruption reigns supreme. And, you know, we point to the big issues like, you know, something happened in government or in business where people stole money or lacked integrity. We look at the big uh, uh, failings of, you know, maybe some high-profile preachers who were sexually impure. But how often do we look at the little things in our lives? Ecclesiastes says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little impurities uh, that ruin. We need purity so bad. I've said this before from my secular work that I did when I first got saved was uh, uh, dealing with domestic drinking water, the water that comes through your tap. And I was a superintendent of the city that I worked for before I got saved, but I had worked through a number of cities at that time. And one of the problems that was happening in the Los Angeles area is that for years, uh, dry cleaning firms had just illegally dumped some dry cleaning agents in these dry riverbeds that are just everywhere because Los Angeles is basically a desert. And uh, they would dump them and they seeped into the groundwater. No one thought when they dumped them that they would ever get down to the groundwater. And the amount of uh, the uh, chemical that actually got into the water were like parts per million, very minuscule amounts, but it deemed that water undrinkable, unsafe. A little bit of impurity can deem your life uh, unusable, undrinkable, unsafe. This is why we have to start taking it much more seriously. The Bible says, as the days darken, Romans 13, as the days darken, that we need to become more aware, more vigilant of these things. We need to guard our hearts because we're all capable of just, as a matter of fact, we're kind of like impurity magnets. We just kind of like, every day we wake up, we're like kind of zoning in on impurity. What's impurity? Let me find something impure. See, I know some of you are like holy and righteous. Well, the truth is, it's hard sometimes. You have to work at it. I told this story a long time ago, uh, probably told it here, I think, about when uh, Gracie and I were first together, and I had actually been there when I was a kid as well. Um, I was a kid when I met her. What am I saying? You know, I was 19 years old, didn't know what I was doing. All I knew is I saw this beautiful girl with nice calves and said, I, uh, uh, that's the way they told her in Liverpool. I said, Gail, you got calves. <laughs> said, man, they got that right. But I remember us going to this place. It was hot, like it always is in L.A. in the middle of summer. And we went there swimming and involved in it. But it, it, we thought it was so cool because it was like a river in the, in the urban area. But the reality of it was it was uh, the effluent of a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> And the water was semi-clean, I have to say that. It wasn't fully polluted, but uh, nevertheless, it's not a place that you would take your kids and say, hey, you like a drink? <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, in Spanish, they called it Marrano Beach, which is, uh, means pig, pig beat Marranos would go there. But yet we were there, and some people are doing that exact same thing with their lives. They act as if they're just swimming around, but they're really allowing this impurity to come in. And the Bible is telling us and teaching us something totally different. Allow purity to reign in your life. Let the purity that comes from God be that which produces fruitfulness in your life. There's a scripture that I've actually been writing some messages on, and have been, it's kind of haunting me. That's why I can't really get it together. But uh, Jesus says, you know, be holy as I'm holy. The Lord in the Old Testament says, be holy as I'm holy. Now think about that for a second. He says he wants us to be holy like he's holy. I look and I go, who can do that? How can that happen? Some people look at the miracles of the Bible and that kind of builds unbelief. Ah, how could God ever part the Red Sea? How could that ever happen? I look and say, this makes me filled with unbelief. You want me to be holy like you are? Do you know who you're talking to? (laughs) I'm better at sinning, aren't you? No, no, you guys aren't even admitting. I'm up here admitting it. Are you admitting it? Are you good at sinning? 
Yes, you are. Are you prone to it? Yeah. But yet, God says, I want purity to come from your life to the point where you're holy. See, in order for us to consistently bear the fruit of God, we're going to have to live in the purity of God, drinking in that which God uh, gives to us, the right nutrients uh, in order to grow. We need to be seeking the throne of God in order to receive the purity from Him. Are you with me here today? And understand that this fruit bearing is not just a one off, a here and there, maybe on Christmas, a little bit on Easter. If we have a pretty powerful revival, I'll bear some fruit, you know. Uh, it's not really like that. The Bible says that He wants us to bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit. It's an ongoing process of fruit bearing. It should be the focus of our attention as Christians uh, to be a fruit producer. And in order for that, we're going to have to not only come to the river of the water of life, but we're going to have to submit to God's fertilization plan. Turn with me in your Bibles into the book of Luke, chapter 13. God's fertilization plan. Pray for me. I'm having trouble pronouncing words because I'm getting confused in my mind because someone planted a seed in me. They didn't mean to. I was preaching on, on like anti-freedom, you know, anti-this. And, you know, as a California, I say anti, and they said you should say anti, you know. And so now I'm constantly trying to pronounce words <laughs> properly, you know. And it's like, I'm just going to say it like I say it, and you'll kind of get it. <laughs> I promise it's English. If it's not English, I'll tell you this isn't English, but I am speaking, and I'll try to speak slow enough that everybody can comprehend. Fair enough? Now, if you'd do that for me, we'd all be good. God's fertilization plan, Luke 13, starting at verse 6, the New King James Version. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that you can cut it down. See, many of us are at the place of this parable. We're at the place where God comes seeking fruit in our lives. Some of you have been saved an appropriate amount of time to now produce fruit in your lives. And God says, look it, I've given you time Three years, which isn't, doesn't mean necessarily that that's the time he gives to each one to bear fruit, but it's an appropriate amount of time. And he, when he comes to them and they have not borne fruit, his initial reaction is, cut it down. Cut it down. And so that doesn't mean the cruelty of God. That's the justice of God. That's the righteousness of God. If God says to do something and we don't do it, he has every right to cut us down. Matter of fact, we've sinned so much, he has every right just to cast us out, but by his grace, he keeps us in. So when he says, hey, I want you to bear fruit, we shouldn't go, man, so much. Why is he demanding so much of me? (laughs) Are you kidding? What has he given to us? We need this spiritual fertilizer in our lives to produce more fruit. Think of something here in this parable. The only thing that stopped the judgment of God against that tree in the vineyard was the fertilizer that was being placed at the root in order to give it time to grow. So the fertilizer is an important aspect of this story. We need spiritual fertilizer so we can grow and therefore stop God's judgment in our lives. Can you say amen? Amen. Are you with me? Stay with me because I'm preaching important stuff. Actually quite good here. (laughs) 
You ought to be telling all your friends and family, man, my pastor can preach, man. He really knows how to preach. You actually should do that. Don't lie, but you should do that because it might cause them to come to church and not only hear me, but hear God, and then God can touch them and save them. Praise God. So in the natural, fertilizer is unpleasant. It's, it's not something we all enjoy. You know, at least here in uh, this beautiful country in which we all live, you know, when fertilizer is placed on something, it's usually so cold we don't smell it too much. But if you come from a warm country, a hot country, a humid country where fertilizer is spread, man, you know it. It is some vile stuff because you know what fertilizer is, right? You know where it comes from. It comes from the, yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm saved. It comes from a place, uh, it, it, it's tough. It's just tough stuff. Let's just leave it at that. So if we're going to look at spiritual fertilizer in our lives to bear fruit, sometimes that means we're going to go through some unpleasant experiences that are going to cause us to turn towards God and become more fruitful. Some hard times, some difficult seasons which make us be humbled in our spirit and say, I can't do this. I need you, God. What do you want me to do? I've been trying your, my plan for so long, but it hasn't worked. And now I need you to work in my life. And when you begin to do that now, that hard, ugly situation is actually being used by God to glorify Him and produce fruit in you. We can't always see what God is up to in our lives. What God is up to right now, you might not even know what He's doing. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this in the book of John, chapter 13, and verse number 7. Jesus says, what, am I, what I am doing now you do not understand, but afterward you will understand. That's a simple statement, but that tells us something. What you're doing, what he's doing in your life right now, you don't get. You don't understand. Two weeks of trial that I've been involved in, I'm not really sure what's going on. I'd like to consider myself somewhat spiritual and a pretty good Bible follower, but honestly, I couldn't tell you what is really happening. Matter of fact, I've been kind of broken before God at times. I've been upset and angry at other times. I've been indifferent through the last two weeks. See, these are things that you go through. You go through all of these. And as long as you stay in God, those are perfectly adequate responses to trials because God's up to something. I don't know now, but the Bible guarantees me afterward, I'll be able to look back and say, now I know. What you're going through now, you'll never know what it's all about until you get on the back side of it. Are you with me? This fertilizing experience is what produces faith in our lives. Too many of God's people have little, little faith. They really don't trust. They don't make any steps of faith. They don't do anything that's outside of their comfort zone. They only do things that feel uh, uh, like they were going to have a good return on their investment. <laughs> What we need here, see, that's how a lot of businessmen operate. They have this thing called ROI, return on investment. And they operate by that. They have calculations that they do, and they decide, okay, should I risk? Should I have faith in that company? What's my ROI, my return on my investment? But then there's a group of businessmen, usually wealthy, and they, they're called venture capitalists. And what they do is they just take money and say, look, at this looks really risky, but the reward, if, I, if it pans out, is going to be huge. God is not looking for ROI investors. He's looking for venture capitalists, wealthy people in God uh, that are able to say, I will risk and trust him to bear fruit. I will risk and trust him to have faith, to see his hand move uh, in my life, my family's life in Manchester, throughout the world. See, you've got to stop getting upset every time your life smells bad. You've got to, because th th that's a process that you're going through. It's an important thing. 
Prior to us landing here in October of 2016, uh, six months of the hardest, literally the hardest, most difficult, most strenuous time in our lives occurred. But when we got here, it was like as soon as we landed, it felt like, it felt like, praise God, praise God. God's doing something already. And we had lots of struggles up ahead. Why am I telling you my story? Because you have a story just like ours. It might have different circumstances, different players, different actors, but the same kind of thing. God is putting you through things where your fertilization of your life is his plan for your life. But not only do we have to submit to the river of life to get nutrients from him, purity and righteousness and then the God's fertilization plan, but there's also something called God's pruning plan. God's pruning plan, I say called that. I called it that. (laughs) John chapter 15. Can you turn there? John chapter 15. If you're able, you can go to the New King James Version. Notice that these are not uh, passages that have prerequisites. That means that they'll apply to all believers. They're not just for men or just for women or just for that class or that culture or just for this dispensation, this time. No, it's not that. This is for all Christians at all times we're going to go through these. And so here is one that we're all, it's universal. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. This is Jesus speaking. So he's not the fake vine. He's not the halfway sort of true vine. He's not the the good vine that we all like, but there's other options. He's not the optional vine. He's the true vine. He's the one. When people tell you, well, what about this religion, that religion? I'd say, well, does your religion have the true vine? No, we, we have, but we have a book, and we have a prophet, and we have this, and we have a holy land, and we have uh, options, and we get to wear orange sheets and dance around and bang tambourines very cool like... Well, that kind of turns me on a little bit. I don't want to go to that kind of religion. I want to go to the one that has a true vine. You didn't even catch that little I got turned on by roaring sheet thing that I just said. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me. Are you a branch? Yes, you are. If you're a Christian, you're a branch. That does not bear fruit, he takes away. It's pretty powerful when you think about it. Fortunately, most theologians believe that branch is not just talking about individual people, but situations and circumstances as well as people in our lives. It says he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So if you're a branch and you're bearing some fruit, but not enough fruit, he's going to prune you. He's going to prune you that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3 says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So he's not talking about getting saved. He's not, saying, not talking about having your soul cleansed. You're already clean, cleansed because of what Jesus has done, said and done, what he prophesied to these disciples and what he did for us. And in verse 4 he says, Abide in me and I in you. There's the relationship aspect uh, that Pastor Allen was speaking about this last Wednesday. We have to have relationship with him. Abide in me. That's something that we do, not something that he does. When we abide in him, then he abides in us. If you choose not to abide in him, he's not going to do it. See, you're pathetic if you're always seeking after someone to love you and to be in relationship with you. And God is never going to do that. He's never going to say, come on, please love me, please love me, please, please, come on. If you don't love me, I don't look like God. He doesn't do that. He, nor does he stand off aloof and say, well, hey, man, you know, you got to do certain steps to come to me. He's doing everything humanly and, and spiritually possible to get you to come to him. But my point being is that you have to come to him. You have to choose to abide in him. When you wake up in the morning, you have to choose, am I going to abide in Christ? 
You're already clean. You're already saved. But are you going to live in him for today? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. That sounded really strong. Abide in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. That's why some of us are getting nothing. Because we're not abiding in him. And without him you can do nothing. That's why you just are churchgoers in, in the sense of, please, I'm not saying this to irritate you or upset you. I'm just trying to point out what the word is telling us so that we can get the blessings of what he's telling us. If anyone does not abide in me, as he is cast as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Verse 8 says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Ongoing fruit bearing is his goal. That's his desire. In order for that to happen, thinning must take place. Pruning must take place. I should probably preach about pruning every other week because it's an ongoing thing. (laughs) The owner of my flat sends out a gardener about once a year. And he basically is just a brutal individual that has some sort of equipment that just sees anything that's living and hacks it to the ground because he knows he's not coming back for another year. But if he did something ongoing a little bit this week, a couple of weeks, in a month, he could prune and shape it and make it into a wonderful English garden. But instead, I just have a Mancunian mess. God does not work like that. He prunes and he thins and he knows what to do. Sometimes there's just too much leaves and not enough fruit. Too much outward show. Too much amen, hallelujah, praise God, God bless you and all of the Christian words and not enough heart. Not enough inside. Not enough of that. I want to tell you, man, God is not looking for fakers, posers. He's not looking for those who pretend. He's looking for those who admit who they are but are real with Him. They're not just living in this world with a little bit of God. They're living for God in this world. You got it? This is important. So He must thin. He must prune. The question is, and I've preached about this before to you guys, is what does he prune? What does he prune? What is it? What particulars? Well, the general umbrella term is anything that hinders spiritual growth and anything that fails to bring him glory. Anything in your life that's hindering spiritual growth, God's got the snippers. God's got the loppers. God is looking at it there, what he can do. Anything that fails to bring him glory, anything that kind of casts a dark shadow over Christianity, God has his knife out ready to trim it because he only wants to be glorified. Can you say amen? Amen. So what does this, how does he do this? Well, he starts by putting things in our hearts. This is one method that he uses. He puts things in our hearts. I can remember when I was a new convert and, uh, you know, we had come off the streets. I say off the streets because even though we had jobs and lived life, we just had this street mentality. Drug addiction was just part of everybody that we knew, even though those that had jobs, not everybody was a down and outer and homeless, but they just kind of had this, this mentality of the street. It's the only way I can describe it for you. And it wasn't good. It wasn't good. And so when you come into Christianity where they talk about purity and holiness, that was foreign to us. Gracie and I grew up in homes where our parents loved us and cared for us but taught us totally wrongly on what it was to be a a, a Christian. Didn't give us any guidance at all in this because they weren't Christians themselves. 
So when we came to Christ, we weren't sure what to do, but the Holy Spirit was sure. The Holy Spirit began to teach us things. And I remember as a brand new convert, you know, I listened to a lot of music, you know, rock music that at that time was pretty bad and pretty raunchy, but also some R&B and some hip-hop and that kind of music, some street funk music that was going on in Los Angeles at the time, and a lot of it had explicit lyrics and was not good and not holy and nothing Christian. And I remember thinking, you know, I shouldn't be listening to that. That's not really going to work for me now. If I'm going to live for God, I can't be acting like I'm Robert Plant or Jimmy Page, for those that know. I can't act like I'm R. Kelly or any of these other crazy nuts that were out there. I can't be allowing those words to infiltrate my mind. And you know what it was? It was God putting it in my heart because he was pruning. He was pruning me. Because I had already had the fruit of salvation. I was different. I was changed. But God wanted more from me, just like he wants more from you. And he puts it in your heart. I can remember Gracie was a new convert. She had been saved before me, but wasn't really sanctified. (laughs) She's going to church, but I was just weighing her down. And for all of you ladies who have an unsaved husband, we're praying for you because we know how difficult it can be. And she had trouble. But once I became a Christian, we kind of linked together and wanted to grow. We didn't really know what that meant But all of a sudden, uh, she began to change her wardrobe, you know. The things that she used to wear, she didn't wear anymore. She began to dress a lot more modestly. And that was a good thing. At first, I was kind of like, whoa, girl, what happened? (laughs) I mean, let me tell you, God's not against sexy. I just want to say it. God's not against sexy. He just doesn't want sexy on display for every other Tom, Dick, and Harry out there. (laughs) But at the something happened in Gracie where God was pruning away that thinking of, well, I have to be this kind of look. I have to kind of put all this on display. And as you can see, she's well dressed, and it's always been well dressed. And that's why now that she's uh, a little bit older now, she still looks wonderful and still looks great because. God pruned her in her 20s. Is God pruning you with some things, saying, hey, you need to let that aside? And, and it may be something that no one's telling you about because no one told me, hey, don't stop listening to those bands. No one told Gracie, hey, you know what, here's what you wear. You know, you got to look like a nun, you know. This is how you got to be. And no one said anything like that at all. She just thought, you know what, I'm saving this for Tom and no one else is going to have a look-see at this. Did you get that, what I just said? And every man here knows, you know, you want it all for yourself, right? And I say this towards the ladies because, men, we're boring. We could rip our shirts off and no one would care. If we showed off our stuff, most people would just gag, you know. (laughs) But ladies, it doesn't matter what you look like. We'll be like this. And that's why we do these things, because God's pruning us so that we can bear fruit. This is not a legalistic thing. Those things are kind of easy, the things, easy in the sense of being simple, those things he puts in our hearts. But then there's some things that he does that are other types of pruning, and they're more painful. Sometimes he takes away our money. You might lose your job for no particular reason. You might be downsized in your firm for no particular reason. At a moment's notice, it may go from making this to making that, and you're wondering, hey, what went on here? And none of us likes to lose money. But something happens when your money is cut. You begin to now cry out. Now you begin to do one of two things. Either you chuck your Christianity, or you begin to trust in your Christianity. One of the two. And God pruning that, as painful as it is, sometimes the loss of money is the greatest blessing we could ever have because it brings us to a place of confidence. Sometimes God allows, I'm careful with my wording here, God does not make us sick, but God knows that there's sin in the world, and I want to tell you, God will use the sin in the world to bring about his purposes. You can read throughout the scriptures there. God will use crazy people to bring him glory. There's one in the United States right now, and he's doing the same thing there. 
But understand that he will sometimes take things away in order for him to be able to produce trust and confidence. And I was saying the thing about being sick. There was a guy that we had pastored for a long time, and he was in and out of church. You know, he'd served God fervently for two months, and you'd see him, and then you wouldn't see him, you know. I'd run into him on the street. He'd cry, I'm sorry, you know, I need to come back to church. I said, look it, man, you need to come back to Jesus. That's what you need. And he would be backslidden. And then his daughter, who was now an adult, you know, she started coming to church, got saved, serving God. She was faithful, spot on. Her mother died, and so she just committed herself to Christ. And that was a turning point in her life. But her father, who was in and out, he uh, uh, contracted cancer, a very bad form of cancer. And he came to church, and he was coming. You know, he, he couldn't walk. He was in, it was rotting his spine, and he would come in a wheelchair, and they'd push him in. He just looked absolutely horrible, like death warmed over. And I remember praying for him almost every service. I'd bring him up to the front, and I'd pray for him to be healed and to be touched. Uh, and I remember him, me and him having a chat after service, and he told me this. He says, you know, my sickness has been my greatest blessing. He said, because this has brought me to my senses. He goes, God's been calling me for years. He'd say, you know that, Pastor. And I'd say, yes, I did. But it was this thing that God was pruning away in order for him to bear fruit. See, so often we look at that, we bind the devil in that. You with me? Sometimes friends, you know, some of you are like Sister Gracie, you know, very social, very uh, wanting to talk, and you draw a lot of strength from your friendships, and you like having people around you, and it it begins to make you feel like you're part of the team, uh, and all of a sudden, one friend drops off, another friend drops off, sometimes they leave your own church, and you begin to lose a friend that you grew up in Christ with, and it's so painful, isn't it? You're like, what happened? I thought we were here to the end. And you have to now make a decision, don't you, of what you're going to do, who you're going to follow, what you're going to believe. And God is sometimes pruning, not all the time, but sometimes pruning those friends in order to produce strength in you. He says, you've been weak for too long. You've been relying on other people to do for your Christianity. Now I want you to rely on me and my word. Are you with me? This is critical here. (laughs) Sometimes for those of you that have been a Christian for a long time, there are seasons where you were ministering, you know, and you were in ministry, whatever that ministry was. There's a variety of things we could talk about. You were in ministry, and you felt excited. You were serving, and maybe even got a bit of notoriety and encouragement from that, and I totally understand it. I, I like when people, hey, Pastor Tom, I, hey, how are you doing? Hey, are you still pastoring here? You know, uh, even my uncle, I hadn't heard, of, heard from in years. He's not a Christian, but he found out I was pastoring over here, sent me an email, found out from our website, Pastor Allen, praise God, and sent me a, an email and said, hey, you know, I, I tracked you down, Pastor Tom. He called me Pastor Tom. I like that. I'm like, even my uncle knows I'm a pastor feels good. feels good when you have people as a pastor. You know, as people coming to church, it makes you feel pretty good. You feel like, okay, I'm preaching the word here, and people are getting fed, and that's good. Maybe you're singing songs or serving in the nursery, and you got, hey, a few more kids here, and you're excited. You got a bunch of kids. Some of you don't care. You're like, give me less kids. But uh, those that love nursery saying, hey, bring in more kids. Hey, we had five kids. We had 18 youth in, in Sunday school. And then it goes down. The numbers drop. The attendance drops. The vibe drops. The fervency and the fire and the passion seems to wane. You're leading a group of people, two, three, four, five, and they're all like loving it. Yes, yes, whatever you say, leader, I'll do. And all of a sudden now they're like, oh, I'm busy. I can't make it. And you're just there by yourself and God's snipping ministry from you. Not because he wants to hurt you. And not because he's being brutal like the gardeners at my flat. (laughs) He's trimming like a master husbandman. He's a vine dresser that knows 
how to trim. And this is what's necessary in your life to get you to where he wants you to be, not where you want to be, where he wants you to be. And the truth is, I have to just be perfectly frank and out there with you, is that when he is in pruning mode, any thing that is out there, dead, active, inactive, dormant, alive and blossoming, is prone to his pruning because he has different desires when he's pruning. Sometimes he's trimming away all the dead stuff, but sometimes he's trimming some live stuff that we're like, whoa, that, that's pretty good. I, I like that part of my life. That, that makes me who I am, and now you're cutting off who I am. Now I can't even be me anymore. <laughs> Maybe God doesn't want you to be you. Maybe God wants to transform you into something different. Maybe he wants you to be, whatever your name is, version 2.0. Maybe he wants to take you to a new place in your marriage. Maybe you're not, your marriage is not fun and happy. I mean, me and Gracie, we were like party animals when we were young. We just were like always having fun, always fooling around. We were like Bonnie and Clyde, man, you know, just ripping and running and doing all kinds of bad things. And, you know, when we got saved, we just transferred that into Christianity and we're still just like, you know, lighthearted and always having a blast. And, you know, and then life got real somewhere along the road. Gracie blames me, which she's probably right. You got serious, dude. What happened to you? Well, God was transforming me into something else. He didn't need a Clyde. He needed Tom, the pastor. See? And that's sometimes what he's doing to your life. And you might be in that situation right now, folks. God's fertilizing you. God's saying, hey, start drinking from the river of the water of life. You're not bearing fruit? I'm going to fertilize you. You're going to have some, you might be there for quite some time, but I'm saving you from judgment. And now he's trimming. He's trimming, trimming. And you're like, well, there's nothing left. Is there anything left? I'm just like a twig here, you know. I'm just barren. Yeah, but when that springtime comes, that tree that has nothing on it in winter, all of a sudden you just see that little bit of green. And for those of us who are longing for the warm weather, we just look and go, praise God, I see green. The brown is going and the green is coming. And sometimes that's how our lives are. There's one little thing that happens before you know it, you're in full bloom. As Pastor Allen said a while back, you know, the cherry blossoms just come out. You begin to look and you see the color and the vibrancy that wasn't there. That comes through trimming oftentimes in our lives. The river of the water of life. Let's give the Lord a hand clap today. Hallelujah. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www newharvestuk.com You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester M36BY We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.